back on Tuesday. Very good. And then after Tuesday, we'll get right into Chapter 10, which is applying this genetic uh, information. So, um, Just to recap, we talked about what type of cell division on Tuesday? Mitosis. Then what type of cells will undergo a mitotic cell division? Somatic cells. Okay, cells of the body, not... Not sex cells. Good. Not gametes. Not eggs. Not <coughs> sperm. Okay. Now, um, that leads us up to then. Well, then, what kind of cell division do our sex cells carry out? And it's called what? Meiosis. Your other, like your lab instructors, may call it meiosis. I call it meiosis. Tomato, tomato. They're the same thing. M e i o, m e i o s i s. Meiosis. Meiosis cell division, to take the chromosomal numbers to what? From 2N to 1N. Take them from diploid to haploid. So we're going to try to produce some uh, haploid cells. If you look at um, the chapter 9 discussion, it's just going to talk about uh, how it says how genetic information is passed from one generation to another, basically how we form the sex cells. Uh, genetically, we're not going to get into morphological neatness. Uh, so we'll talk about um, as well uh, mitosis, or excuse me, sexual versus asexual reproduction. We'll uh, review chromosomes in a diploid versus a haploid cell, and we'll look at the role of meiosis, which you guys really just reviewed. Again, review the difference between a haploid versus a diploid cell. And then we'll spend the bulk of the time looking at the phases of meiotic cell division. We'll look at specifically what happens to those chromosomes during meiosis. And then hopefully we'll have time to talk about what the purpose is to give us some genetic diversity. So we'll conclude uh, with that. And then hopefully we'll have time as well to visually see the difference between mitosis versus meiosis. What about, so from your handout that you guys completed, turned in on Tuesday, what is asexual reproduction? Reproducing, making a new individual, is making a copy of it. You might have like accidentally used the word like clone, something like that. Mm -hmm. So in asexual reproduction, genetic material is replicated, it's doubled up and then halved again to make two separate cells, two separate individuals. What type of organisms, without like listing a specific species type, but what type of organisms do you think might divide asexually? Uh, our bacteria and our archaea, right? Our prokaryotic organisms predominantly uh, divide asexually. There's always unique, simil similar, I guess, situations, and so some eukaryotic organisms can also kind of go through a phase of asexual reproduction. Um, really well characterized with bacteria. <coughs> Probably just bacteria just grows, divides, splits, and now we have two bacteria. And they go on and live independent of one another. We can contrast this, right? We already identified uh, the genetic information is identical. If we contrast this to sexual reproduction, the, the, the term sexual, don't confuse this with their, your society history right now. It doesn't conjure up probably doesn't conjure up what's going on in your head right now, okay? So it's not the act of what humans do or dogs do <laughs> or whatever, right? It's, it's at the molecular level, the cellular level. Uh, so what does this term, sexual reproduction, what does it technically mean? <laughs> Two, we can use the word parents or
genetically what? Different. Different and unique. So gametes are sex cells. What's another word for a sex cell? I could call it a germ cell. Very good. I have, I have gametes. You could just as well write germ or sex cell, okay, but not, what would we not write here? Not a, what kind of cell would not do this? Somatic cell. So yes, I, I tend to use the word sex cells or gametes, but germ cell is a, a, the term that your textbook uses to illustrate the reproductive cells. So gametes will fuse, that means just join, and it forms one cell, so that cell is genetically unique. What's, what's an advantage of sexual reproduction besides genetically uniqueness? What do you think would be What's the kind of design or advantage, biological advantage to this? Might allow for evolution. Mm -hmm. And what's the whole point behind evolution? To a survival. survival. Yeah. To an environment <coughs> that is always what? Changing. Okay. And so if the environment changes enough, and if there's enough diversity, at least maybe some of the offspring will survive, not necessarily all, but some will survive. Okay, so if there's a change in environment, as illustrated by the dark line here, if all the species or all the individuals of a given species or population were genetically the same, they are exposed to the same catastrophic event, like say a tsunami, or what are you just name all the events? Okay flood and drought, whatever, um, it's possible that all of those organisms would die and that genetic diversity is, or that, that genetic material is now gone, or you would call it extinct. However, with the advantage of sexual reproduction, there gets diversity, and when there's a challenge in the environment, genetically speaking, some of those individuals in that population might be better suited to survive. Maybe there might still be mass loss of a given species, but there's still a, a few that, that can survive in the environment. So it gives us diversity uh, and hopefully favor survival is the whole point, basically. Does that make a little sense? Is one type of reproduction better than the other? Like overall, for in, in the world, the biosphere as we know, is there, is there one that's better than the other? Each organism is best suited for its environment. Bacteria, they're going to be here a long time, even though they're all genetic clones, basically, from one another. They're suited for their environment. There's enough numbers of them that I doubt we can wipe out the entire population of bacteria globally. You know? So it just depends on the species environment, but other organisms, obviously sexual reproduction is preferred. Now, if you remembered, um, in mitosis, we said, what type of cells divide during mitosis? Somatic, Somatic cells. And we had the example, we talked about brain cells, fat cells, muscle cells, whatever, uh, where our somatic diploid cells, or we use the letter 2N, what does the letter N represent? Mm -hmm. Number of, number of,
which is 2n, so 1n from your mother's egg, basically, from your mother's egg, how many came from one egg from your mother, just right here, and the other one in basically from your father. So all your body cells, your somatic cells, would have a total of 46, or we could just say 2n. 2 times the n represents the human, 23. Diploid cell. And genetically speaking, here I have the word identical. I want you to reiterate or maybe point out to you. Genetically identical. Not necessarily what? Physically. Anatomically. My nerve cells don't look like my skin cells, which don't look like my muscle cells. But if I were to take the DNA out of all of those nuclei, better be, better be identical. So they create identical, genetically identical cells. They develop differently. They transcribe, translate different proteins. They build differently, express different proteins differently. So in the human, I said in the human, uh, each somatic cell will have 46 chromosomes. Is that the same number for all species? No. Very good. And we already identified. So 23 from the mother, 23 from the father. Collectively, that would give us two and a half. Okay, on the, my, the mitosis kind of summary, we went through the cell cycle. We talked about interphase, the mitotic phase that arises to these different um, cells, off daughter cells. Uh, those 23 pair of chromosomes are called homologous chromosomes, which we also define. Does anybody remember the definition of a homologous? They are built the same, but they built the same, they look the same, but there's something maybe a little bit different about them. Of the chromosomes from your mother, of the chromosomes from your father. The chromosome number one from my mom would be physically the same, but what would be different between them? Hopefully. What part, what about it? What part of the DNA might be a little bit different? The structure should be the same. Our DNA should be double-stranded, anti-parallel, complement. But what would be a little bit different between my mom's coding for chromosome one versus my father's coding for chromosome one? It might be a little bit in the sequence of the DNA, the nucleotide. The nucleotide sequence. I'm just going to call out a sequence, say, if I'm looking at my ATPA structure, my ATP synthase, remember that? Maybe in a short segment from my father, I'm going to G, C, C, G. My mother is a G, C, C, C. We have a slight base, but the difference. Which still coded on chromosome one, but they're not genetically identical from my parents. Because my parents aren't what? They're not the same person, and they're not identical twins. Right? It's not possible. <laughs> so hopefully there's some genetic diversity in my lineage. And there is. <laughs> and hopefully there is also in yours. Okay? But just to recap, we said these are called homologous pairs. Of the 23 pairs, chromosome one from my mother is homologous to chromosome one from my father. They look the same, they're physically the same size, they look like the same X or Y shape, but there might be some base differences between them, which implies I didn't come from this, I'm not, I wasn't formed by asexual reproduction. All right, so that's mitosis. We have diploid cells that double up their DNA, go through a round of division, splitting up the homologous chromosomes evenly between the daughter cells. So within the cells, though, the homologous chromosome sequences in my skin cells would be the same as the chromosome sequence in the, in the, in the DNA in my brain as the same as the DNA in my muscles, <coughs> whatever, in my somatic cells. All right, so the question is, well, what if our gametes did this? 
What if our gametes divided by mitosis? What would happen? Well, let's remember, mitosis does what to your DNA? First it doubles it up and then splits. So what if my gametes that are eventually going to be used for what? Say the egg and the sperm are going to be used for fertilization. So what if my gametes divided by mitosis and not meiosis? How many chromosomes would a sperm cell have then? It has 23, but if it divided by mitosis, it would actually have 46. And the egg, if it divided by mitosis, it would also have 46. And the egg fused, well, maybe it would have four in. And so then it has our chromosome numbers dictate our species. So then would the offspring be alien baby, right? It's not, it, it wouldn't make sense. We would just completely create a whole different thing. And so it doesn't work that way. So we need to have the DNA, and that process is called um, meiosis. So this is a hypothetical situation. This is not happening. If a sperm divided by mitosis and if an egg divided by mitosis, they wouldn't have the DNA. The DNA would be, the cells would be diploid. If we join two diploids, we'd have four times the amount of DNA instead of the correct amount. And so we need to uh, reduce the number of chromosomes in the sex cells for sexual <coughs> reproduction so we don't make random weird species and have an excuse for okay? And that would just keep doubling, right? If that thing reproduced, its offspring would have even more. Okay? So it, it doesn't make sense. So there's a purpose behind meiosis. So if we look at an over, overview, in meiosis, it doesn't produce But we divide it not once, but how many cell divisions are there? Two cell divisions to make four cells. And they are called haploids. They used to say one in. And so the human, one times the number of chromosomes is two in is how much? 46. So one in would be 23. So in the human, we would have sperm cells with 23 chromosomes and uh, O's egg cells with 23 chromosomes in them. So each gamete cell in the human, and I have a typo in there, each gamete cell would have 23 chromosomes. If you're wanting, my picture didn't turn out very big, but that's zooming in. That's what the left thing on the far right is the lady oocyte or ovaries. We also identified how many cell divisions? Mm -hmm. Two cell divisions. And how many times do you think the DNA is replicated? Just one round of original replication. So the DNA is doubled up one time, and then we have two cell divisions. So we can produce one, two, three, four haploid sex cells. Does the summary make sense a little bit? Why, why meiosis is important? I'll go through it right now. So if we look at meiosis, okay. It says during fertilization, if we take a single, two single haploid cells, 23, a one in, a one in, the offspring, the newly developed little zygote or embryo, would have 46 chromosomes, or we could say two in, in that. So here's a question that you had. In the human, 
I can say 23 plus 23, 23 plus A, same as for the sperm, gives the baby 46 chromosomes. Any other species, you can just say 1N from the egg, 1N from the sperm equals 2N for the resulting offspring. So the offspring will have the correct amount of chromosomes. So it would be diploid in its body itself. Did I answer your question? Yes. Very good. All right. Um, in this image, I'm not sure the species, usually a rat or a human, but uh, does anybody know what that is? A sperm and an egg. Okay. And so in that tiny little head of the sperm cell, which is this human waist little, 23 little chromosomes which they have in them. And it's usually an oocyte. So we're going to see where, what is it about that genetic material there. Uh, additionally, not all species have the exact same life cycle like a human. You know, clearly, a human develops right after the fusing, 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 excuse me, between an egg and a sperm cell during fertilization, then develops a little baby. The baby grows into a child, into adolescent, adult, which they can make gametes. Uh, other species, like here we have a, um, a frog, and it goes through a unique cell division where it has what's called a juvenile and can grow into an adult. Other plants, some plants have some different life cycles. Right? So not all life cycles are the same, but if we can fundamentally understand that the gametes have half as much chromosomes so that the resulting adult would have the correct amount of chromosomes. Okay, good point. In meiosis, there are two major phases. They are called meiosis one and meiosis Okay. The subphases are going to sound really familiar, but obviously there's some big things that are going to be different as far as which chromosomes are separated and um, the, the number of chromosomes <coughs> that are in the resulting reproduced cell. So in meiosis one, it's Roman numeral one, and then it's going to have those familiar phases like we saw in mitosis. Okay. And so we go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase telophase, cytokinesis, and then the cells will go into another phase called what? Meiosis II. Okay. And so we'll still see prophase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. It's really important that you understand the role of, and these do go in sequence, so then trickery here, right, meiosis I versus meiosis II, and what happens, what's being separated are lining up during metaphase and being separated during anaphase is where we're going to get to the primary differences between meiosis and mitosis. All right, so um, if we look at what's happening, the takeaway, here's, here's the nitty gritty about each of the meiotic phases. In meiosis one, DNA is replicated. Just like we studied in chapter DNA replication, DNA cloning, etc. So the entire genome is replicated. So we do see doubling up of the genetic material in these cells that are going to undergo meiosis, these kind of stem cells in a man's testes or a female's ovary. So DNA is replicated. This is unique to meiosis what? One. Okay. Secondarily, during meiosis one, our chromosomes will separate during anaphase, but they're homologous chromosomes, not, you guys remember what was separated during mitosis? Not sister chromatids, very good. So in meiosis, homologous chromosomes, whole doubled up replicated chromosomes will separate following meiosis 1, 
you're going to do one, two, three, four chromatins are lined up. If we see four chromatins lined up, we are looking at what type of process? Meiosis one. And so following meiosis one, they'll line up. maybe even draw that the four of them together right there where it says homologous chromosomes are separated at this point because our homologous chromosomes are separating like all of the replicated DNA from that person's mom is going to one side for one chromosome and the, the matching chromosome goes to the other side. Even though the numbers will be the same, the genetics are already mixed up following meiosis one. So even though the numbers are the same, the chromosomal numbers are the same, as we follow the splitting here, one end of the cell you may get chromosome one from the mother and then chromosome three from the father. And so just kind of just rearranging, reshuffling the chromosomes if they would double up. So at that point, because they are all shuffled up and they're not genetically identical, we can go ahead and call them haploid. So following meiosis one, they're called haploid because they are no longer identical. However, following meiosis one, one cell division, so how many cells? Two cells. Those two cells are still, technically still have twice as much DNA so we still need to do what with it again? Still need to divide it again. So the cells can go into which phase? Meiosis two. Okay. So meiosis two, basically there is no more DNA replication because we're trying to have the DNA. So there's no replication. This is critical to understand that during meiosis two, DNA is not replicated. We want to have what type of chromosomes would separate following meiosis two? I think I hear it whispered, I just can't. The sister chromatin will be separated following meiosis two. Oops, sorry. The sister chromatin will separate. This repetition, which type of chromosomes separate during meiosis two? Sister chromatin separates following meiosis two. Backing up the train, during meiosis one, what type of chromosomes would separate? Homologous chromosomes. So basically adjacent to one another, how many individual chromosomes are there? Four. One, two, three, four. Contrasting that to meiosis two, how many chromatids are aligned adjacent to one another? Two. So making a little bit of sense? So following that, two cells went into meiosis two, two cells divided, so we get how many cells? Four cells that genetically are a little bit different 
and the ploidy is haploid. tweaking with the colors all semester, so I'm trying to figure out if that color doesn't work, you just let me know and I'll, I'll change it for future. Well, obviously help for now, but let's hope. All right, so that's a takeaway, right, from meiosis one and two. Let's go through and look at it in a little better detail. This is, I don't have the bigger reference uh, for some reason out here. one during prophase if you remember the phases right prophase 
the DNA is doing what? Condensing. It's, it's what? Becoming visible. So prior to that, it is actually just, prior to prophase, the cell would be in which? That we've not really mentioned. Interphase. What happens during interphase? Very good. So it's, like, I think I said it's doing its thing. And most notably, if we're getting ready for cell division, the DNA does what? It's replicated. So during, as a cell goes into meiosis one, during its interphase, getting ready for division, the DNA replicates. This is only here during meiosis one is when the DNA replicates. Then we get more specifically into prophase one itself. As you guys identified, we said the DNA condenses, okay, where it becomes visible. Okay, so we're going to look under a microscope, we can see the DNA. What begins to pair up here? What begins to associate together? What can we call these? The spindles are beginning to grow, you're right. This, they're attaching to the centrosomes, very good. All right, very good. Our homologous chromosomes. That's, they begin, before they can line up, they've got to associate together. And that happens during prophase. Very good, yes. So before we can align our homologous chromosomes during metaphase, we've got to match them up, okay, before they can be pushed and pulled together. And so that matching up of the homologous chromosomes happens here during prophase one of meiosis. But you guys are right. You can certainly see the, they're now called meiotic spindles because we're in the process of meiosis, but essentially what are they? Yes, they're meiotic spindles, but really what have we called them up till now? you say it? I just can't hear it. We call them spindle fibers, or before we even got into DNA replication, we called them, what are they? Microtubules. Microtubules developing during meiosis are called meiotic spindles, they mean spindle fibers. So we can begin to see the spindle fibers um, attached to the little centrioles. What's lining up during meiosis for phase one? Homologous chromosomes. So how many little sister chromatids? Four. And if you look really closely, you can see one, two, three, four. Those collectively would be a pair of homologous chromosomes. Something really cool does happen called what? You identify it. Crossing over happens here, which is, I, I don't fully understand crossing over, but it does happen. Look how closely these chromosomes, after they've replicated, they're all kind of intimate, like intertwined. Can you see that? And let's just use our color, society color association. Let's go with the chromosomes from the father blue, the chromosomes from the mother pink, okay? And they've replicated, so we've got four, four chromatids all fixed together physically touching one another. <coughs> Cells have the ability then on the tips of those chromosomes to actually take an enzyme and exchange them. What was originally on the father's chromosome is exchanged with the mother's chromosome. And so now, not only are we just kind of mixing up our distribution, we're actually physically changing the structure of the chromosome. We're taking the, si the genes that are from the the code for say eight, we've been using eight, I've been using ATP synthase, so maybe the code for ATP synthase for the father and flip it with the code for one of the mother. So now we're really just shuffling the deck, if you will, with the genetic information. So crossing over is how might we describe this? Exchanging DNA. 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 Exch
exchanging of genetic information between what? Of the chromosomes. That's the easiest part to exchange. Just flip it over. Following prophase one, the cell will then go into <coughs> metaphase one. And this is where uh, I have this image for you in a handout. You can actually see the coloration where the tips are actually exchanged. The magnitude and the degree, the frequency is what I don't understand about what regulates this, but it, it does occur pretty frequently. That's how siblings can look completely different from the same parent group, right, due to things like this and other factors as well, just crossing over. Uh, following prophase one, the cell would enter into metaphase one, and this is the key thing that I really want to highlight I've been stressing all morning is what is aligning at the metaphase place? Homologous chromosome. If you see a tetrad, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, where they're going to be pulled to opposite ends, you see how those pairs? This cell is in what type of division? <coughs> Meiosis one. Okay. So we see them lined up in the middle of the metaphase. During metaphase one, we identify those homologous uh, pairs line up. They were grouped together during what? They were first just found each other during prophase. During metaphase, those spindles push them to the middle. The cell will then enter into Anaphase and what is separated here during anaphase one? Yeah. Homologous chromosome. And they still kind of get pulled back just like we saw before. Okay, so our homologous chromosome get pulled back. The sisters are still grouped together. separate, and I've been really emphasizing the, sis the sister chromatids are still joined together. This cell will then enter into a phase of telophase, where what happens? They're pulled to the opposite end of the, the, the opposite poles. The nuclear envelope will reform and the chromosomes may decondense. The degree of nuclear envelope reformation may, may be kind of moderate during this phase. But that nuclear envelope, it may reform, but maybe not necessarily completely. Although, numerically speaking, at the opposite ends of the cell, it looks like each end would have, in the human, say, 46 chromosomes, but because of the genetic information is all jumbled up, we call these cells what? What type of blade? Haploid cell. Following telophase, the cell will enter into cytokinesis, so we have two cell that are considered to be haploid, or you could say one in. There's still more to go, though, right? Each of these daughter cells then themselves would be split apart. Okay. The duration between meiosis one and meiosis two depends on the species and the gender. Right here, say a woman, lady, you have you, you probably know that you're born with all the eggs that you'll ever have in each ovary. 
And so the cells in your ovaries start meiosis, but they don't finish it until right before what? Right? When? When what? Uh, actually, uh, even before this, when would a cell in the middle of meiosis, an egg cell in a woman's ovary, get out of meiosis one and go to meiosis two? Prior to ovulation. They're hanging around. They won't finish the job until they're needed at ovulation. So, but men, as long as the cells are working functionally, then this process is continuing. So, gender and species uh, differences as well. So, following telophase one, we have cytokinesis, and then at some point in time, the cell will enter into prophase one. What is hands down not happening here? No DNA replication. We've already dealt with that. None of that stuff is going on. So no, no, no. No DNA replication during meiosis 2. But the DNA should still, we want to move it so it should first First, it has to condense, okay, so individual uh, chromosomes. So it recondenses, repackages for distribution. And what begins to pair up now during prophase two? What type of chromosomes? Or you just call them chromosomes, so what about the, the individual little sisters are still paired up together? Sister chromatids are still joined together. These are what we're going to look at during meiosis two. They they are a single homologous chromosome instead of a pair of the other. In other words, if I were to count up the chromatids, how many are grouped together? In my in meiosis two, two. Which, if you look close when you uh, figure nine seven in your textbook, you can see our little sister chromatids making up a single structurally homologous chromosome, but it's not paired with <coughs> another one. So that one's in a whole other cell. It's matched to be in another cell. Okay. And so we're going to see these little structurally different chromosomes being pushed and pulled. So the cell will go from prophase two into metaphase two, aligning in the middle are the, you could call them chromosomes. Um, I just try to reiterate on what's joined together so you don't get it confused later. So what is joined? The sisters, the sisters. But you guys are right, you would call them a single chromosome, a homologous chromosome. So the sister chromatids will line up. We're going to see one, two chromatids instead of one, two, three, four joined together. During metaphase two, this will look a lot like what? This looks and sounds similar to what process? Sounds a whole heck of a lot like mitosis. Meiosis two is very similar mitosis, with the exception of no DNA replication, and we're producing haploid cells. The cell will then enter into which phase? Anaphase, where what is separated? Sister chromatids are actually physically separated from one another. The cell will then enter into which phase? Telophase. And what happens here? Yes, the DNA will re uh, decondense 
and the nuclear envelope will begin to reform. And then the cell cells will go into cytokinesis. Two cells undergo cytokinesis. One, two, so that gives us one, two, three, four cells that That is my meiosis right there, crash course. The whole point is to make the, what kind of cells? Germ cells, or I could say gametes, or I could say sex cells, or I could be specific and I could say sperm, or the plant, I could say pollen, or I could say, I'm looking at a chicken egg, I get chicken egg, right? <laughs> Whatever, that's how these cells are formed. The path is much clearer information so that following fertilization, the offspring has what kind of fluid? The offspring would have during following fertilization, it would be good boy. Uh, up till now, the, t the cells have been really generic looking, like a typical textbook round looking cells. And obviously not all cells are perfectly round. And they don't um, divide necessarily evenly. I have provided for you. Do I have it for you? I didn't show it to you guys. But um, you can look up here. In the humans and other mammals, the cell division is similar between the gender and also uh, species. But you, you fundamentally know that a sperm cell is built differently than an egg cell. And the way that they undergo that initial development is during the process of meiosis. Following meiosis, too, in the formation of sperm cells, there are full, four full cells produced, as we presume, and then they'll grow and specialize, develop the microtubules, and feed their tail, and concentrate their DNA. And so following meiosis, sperm cells, there are four functional sperm cells, like, you, like we've been talking about. I'm pointing this out because if we look at the formation of egg cells, the, cell, the di distribution of the cytoplasm is not equal following each of the phases of meiosis. And so that even though an egg cell might produce one, two, three, four cells, look at the size difference between them. Human egg cells are so big that you can see them uh, without a microscope. I mean, you have to look really closely. But if you're putting them on a the microscope, you can you can see each little egg. Obviously, you see them better with a microscope, but they're that big. So you can you can see them. Oh, that's been working. <coughs> um, let me see if this animation is going to work. I'm not sure that it will. So I wasn't able to pour it into my computer like I was hoping to today. So um, this is just going to go through meiosis one and two, review which we've already covered. This is a, uh, a precursor cell that's going to enter into meiosis one. During prophase one, the DNA has already replicated 
and we can begin to see the spindles forming and the little centrioles which these spindles will attach to. So we already kind of identified that will set, set up the ends of where everything is going to be distributed. After this, the cell will go into what? What is this? Metaphase one, and I know this is metaphase of meiosis inbound because what's a line? Four of them, four homologous chromosomes are all aligned with one another. Very good. Following this, the cell will then enter into anaphase where those homologous chromosomes pairs are separated from one another. Boom. Then the cell will go into telophase and quickly into cytokinesis. At this point, these cells, what type of ploidy? Diploidy. What type of, not diploidy, I was trying to say ploidy. What type of ploidy? Haploid. Because remember we said following meiosis one, numerically speaking, they look right, but genetically they're not right. They won't survive, so we call these haploid. The cell will then go into prophase two. Was the DNA replicated in these cells? No. And now the spindles will attach to individual sister chromatids. And then during metaphase two, I can see what's do I? They're aligned together. The sister chromatids are little aligned together. Then we have, what is this? Anaphase, where we can definitely see those individual chromatids separated from one another. And now another round of telophase and another round of cytophase. Very good. Producing how many cells? Four haploid cells. Bunch of geneticists right here. Any questions at this point? Does that help a little bit? I want to go through and compare mitosis and meiosis. Okay, on the far left is going to be a cell in mitosis, and a cell on the right will be a cell in meiosis. So we're comparing what we studied in the left yesterday, and on the right what we studied today. Each will enter first into prophase where their DNA material has been what? replicated. Okay. We still see the little centrioles forming, the, my, the mitotic and meiotic spindles growing. And then here's our big difference right here. On the far left, hands down, I can see the sister chromatids aligned during metaphase uh, versus metaphase one, the homologous, the two homologous pairs are aligned together form what's called a tetrad, or you can see one, two, three, four chromosomes aligned together. These will then separate during their own anaphase and then enter into the respective telophase and cytokinesis. Numerically speaking, the cells, there's two cells, numerically the chromosome numbers look identical, but the condition on the right is mixed. We have crossing over, we've jumbled up, all kinds of stuff. So the cells on the left stop, they go on and enter into what? Interphase. And the cells on the right, they go into interphase and then probably then into prophase two. And this is where it'll look a whole heck of a lot like mitosis. Where our sisters, chromatids will line up with the equator and then that are separated <coughs> during anaphase finished off during telophase with cytokinesis with one, two, three, four cells that are haploid. Go on to be an egg cell, sperm cell, and eventually would aid in fertilization. Comfortable questions? No, um, no. If you can just understand we have the genetic material. I mean, that's really the critical part. Well, would you say are there any differences between mitosis and meiosis and that being the haploid or diploid? Diploidy? So go back to that uh, the 
meat and potatoes section that I had on your handout. What did I call it? The takeaway. Turn to the takeaway section and you tell and you tell me what's the big differences. See what? So what is the takeaway? There's a chart to look something like this. What I have here to compare and contrast mitosis and meiosis. I want you on your own for the next five minutes to work on this chart on your own, and then we'll conclude with going through it. So on your own, complete this chart, and then we'll review it. The crossing over of her following lives? Yeah. Yes. Which phase though? Both Only phase during phase both phase one. Only during both phase one. Which I prefer. The total number of daughter cells produced following mitosis is two. two. And then following complete round of meiosis, there are four. Why don't you add in there the foidy? Yes, you guys are both correct. Um, for mitosis, it's two diploid cells. For meiosis, it's four haploid cells. What's the purpose of mitosis? Produce identical cells for growth, repair, Purpose of meiosis? Produce, it aids in reproduction to produce cells that are genetically non identical. You guys are going to have Unit 3 exam on Tuesday. Covering chapters 7, 8, and 9. The bulk of our time in this unit was covering which chapter? We spent a lot of time in 7. Most of our time in 7. I think we spent 3 or 4 days in chapter 7. And we spent about 3 days in chapter 8. And 1 day on chapter 9. So proportionately speaking, we'll be represented <coughs> on each, each test. So about 25% or less, really, meiosis. 25% or less mitosis, uh, which is chapter 8, DNA replication, the first part of chapter 8. So if I compare 12 to chapter 7, 8. Yes. So we don't have to worry about like the end of chapter 8. I'm sorry? We don't have to worry about like the end of chapter 8. Talk about Correct. We did not talk cancer about cancer. I will, not, I, did not, I will not hold you accountable for cancer or mutations or the more specific details for somatogenesis or oogenesis. So strictly the things which we discussed in this class, I'll hold you accountable for. And um, we just didn't get to where some of the, the application, which fun part. But uh, anyway, if you have any questions by all means, you can come by and see me or shoot me an email. Or try to get back to you. See you guys. Oh yes, um, thank you. So uh, worksheet number ten. You can go ahead and submit it on your way out, and I'll pick those up. You submitted yours. I did. Okay. You should have picked it up in the folder.